very happy to welcome Mihail Belking uh, to talk to us today. He is a professor at the Haluciolu Data Science Institute at the University of California. And prior to that, he was a professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering uh, at the Ohio State University. So, in, and his research interests are in the theory and applications of machine learning and data analysis. And some of his well-known work are the applications um, of Laplacian eigenmaps, graph and manifold regularization algorithms, as well as polynomial learning of distribution families. And uh, some of his recent work has been concerned with the understanding of statistical phenomena observed in deep learning. And one of the key recent findings is the double descent risk curve that extends the, the textbook U-shaped bias variance trade-off curve beyond the, the point of um, interpolation. So without further ado, um, let's start the seminar. Thank you very much, Becky, and uh, th thank you um, for the invitation. It's very nice um, to be here virtually. Uh, I am, uh, so uh, what I would like to talk about today is some um, recent um, issues in, um, in really in statistics, which have been identified through um, uh, through the empirical uh, theory, uh, through the empirical observations of deep learning. And in some sense, this is a very much a kind of uh, physics minded uh, view. Uh, we observe empirical phenomena and we sort of try to provide reasonable um, theoretical descriptions. So, and in fact, I've been sort of arguing that we have to do more, um, more sort of physics or science kind of based uh, approach to machine learning. Of course, our experimental results are done in the computer, but uh, rather than you, you know the physical world, but it's um, it's a similar setup. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but by the way, uh, please do interrupt me with any questions. Uh, I uh, I am more than happy to uh, uh, you, you you know to slow down and answer any any questions. And uh, uh, yeah. So. So let me proceed. So, uh, well, uh, in, in recent years, we have seen that in the deep neural networks, which are, you know, very complex objects have performed well on uh, many tasks. And um, they, they're really things like this. They're things with very complex structures, uh, have a lot of kind of elements. And they are very uh, sort of non-transparent to observation from the point of view of theory. Like it's not easy to figure out what's going on. And in a sense, uh, we have a sort of crisis of machine learning theory. And uh, sort of on one hand side, uh, there was an argument that machine learning has become um, alchemy as a, uh, very nice talk by Rahim and Rack at 2017. Uh, well, you are using basically very complex recipes to create to, to do things, and this sometimes these recipes seem to work, but it's hard to judge when and how they work because there is somehow no systematic theory of the things. On the other hand, uh, machine learning is. Um, uh, like like Jan yeah, Lipford argued, machine learning is um, theory is looking for lost keys on the lamppost because where's where the light is, right? And there's a cartoon of a drunk person looking uh, who lost his keys and is looking for um, the lost keys on the lamppost. Um, because somehow it's looking at phenomena which are um, sort of accessible through the light of this lamppost, but not really where the key is probably lost. 
I mean, um, I, I should point out that there is no sort of a priori reason to think about, um, you, you, you know, the, the, the light is fixed, right? So hopefully we can move the light to shine in a different direction. But, but that, that was sort of the criticism is that the theory was irrelevant to uh, the practice of machine learning. And um, so what, what, was the, what was the kind of issue here? And there are really two issues. If um, there is a sort of generalization, oops, this is not um, what I want. Uh, there is sort of generalization and optimization. And uh, the first question, which was this very unclear, is why do this very complex over parameterized models generalize? That's number one. And uh, question number two, why can highly non-convex systems be optimized by methods such as stochastic gradient descent? The uh, this talk will primarily be about the first question, but I'll I'll say something about the second one. Actually, in a sense, the second one is easier, but the first one is perhaps more fundamental for um, trying to understand what's going on. So I'll I'll talk about the first one, for which uh, we have now some understanding, but it's not yet uh, you know it's it's not yet complete but it's certainly much, much better than it used to be. Uh, so what will I talk about this? Uh, first, I'll talk about what the issue is with sort of standard analysis, and then I'll um, sort of point out some directions through which we now uh, understand generalization uh, from the theoretical point of view. Uh, and at the end, so that's a somehow the majority of the stock, and at the end, I'll say something about optimization. And please do feel free to ask any questions and interrupt. So, uh, okay. So just to set things up, we have this standard supervised machine learning. We have data XI, YI. XI, this is a training data. XI uh, in RD and YI is uh, just for simplicity labels, minus one, one. And the sort of the goal of machine learning is using this data to construct a new function that best generalizes to unseen data. And what does generalizes mean? Well, actually it's some sort of statement about the future, right? We wanted to predict somehow uh, what will happen in the future. But if you uh, use the simplest and the most standard statistical assumption that this data are sampled from um, some sort of probability distribution independently, then um, the prediction of the future just becomes that we want the expected value over the future, over the unseen data, of some loss function to be minimized. And this loss function, you can think of it as maybe a square loss, a classification loss. Now, so this, 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 is, um, this is kind of the best, right? This is what we really want under, of course, this assumption. Now, uh, most algorithms and um, you know, ma many analysis are based on empirical risk minimization. And the empirical risk minimization is the following thing. You take a class of functions, H, and you try to find a function which minimizes the loss function over the trading data. And that's the procedure. The, well, the procedure, of course, is not just taking argument. The procedure usually has some sort of, um, you know, algorithmic element. Typically, it is gradient descent type of method. So now, uh, the key aspect of this is actually the choice of this age, right? And how do you choose age? Well, uh, sort of a traditional view of this is that you do something like this. This is the so-called U-shaped generalization curve. And the way you do it is um, you say that if age is small, that is, there are too few candidate functions, then uh, your performance on the training sample and on the test sample, so this is uh, 
the red and blue curve correspondingly is is not very good, right? So on the on the on the x-axis here, you have model complexity. On the y-axis, you have um, prediction error. So your generalization is not good, right? Because prediction error is on the test sample is bad. If uh, on the other hand, so that's other fitting. If your model complexity is very high, then your performance on the training data are good, but the performance on the test data is not good because you're somehow overtrading to the test uh, to the training sample. And the goal of this is to find the bottom of this curve where the test sample performance is optimized. That's optimal generalization. And the sort of classical corollary of this is that the model with zero training error is overfit and will generalize poorly. And we will call this zero training error interpolation because mathematically it is simply classical interpolation. Now, uh, let me sort of uh, now, so, so the goal is now I'll, I'll kind of outline the sort of classical analysis of the thing and I'll point out what goes wrong with this in view of the empirical observation. So uh, what's the goal of machine learning? The goal of machine learning, because you will have seen this to find this F star. The goal of empirical risk minimization is to find the F star ARM, right? What's the difference? There are two differences. One is that for ERM, there is this class of functions H. And two is that the sum is taking over the training data rather than the unseen data. But other than that, it's actually um, mathematically looks very, very similar. Now, uh, the claim is that the, uh, the well, I should say, Vapnik's uh, in his book, Statistical Learning Theory, he, he basically said that the theory of induction is based on the uniform law of large numbers, and that effective methods of inference must include capacity control. And that was a sort of foundation of learning theory, well, according to this view, Wapnick's view. And let me um, unfold this a little bit. Empirical loss, so first, what is uh, uniform law of large numbers? It simply means that empirical loss of any f in h approximates expected loss of f. So this is uh, some sort of law of large number type of statement, and it's uniform over this function class h. And second, uh, capacity control just means that h contains functions that approximate f uh, star. Because, well, if f doesn't contain function that approximate F star, then there is no hope to connect those two. And notice that the goal of learning a procedure, right, is to find F star RM, which is close to F star. So if you can connect those two things, then uh, you, you know, you're, you're doing well. So it is easy to see that if you have one or two, well, well, not, not like immediately, but with a little bit of calculation, that if you have one and two, then uh, you can connect F star and F star RM. And this is good because that means that your performance of your algorithm is essentially the same as the optimal. So that's um, machine learning theory. And let me now uh, be a little bit more precise about this is that um, the uniform laws of large numbers are actually usually have the following form. And there, there are many uh, sort of different um, versions of them. But basically, on the left of this inequality, you have the expected risk, which is the future. And on the right, you have the empirical risk. And basically, with uniform law of large numbers, say that the expected risk is bounded by the empirical risk plus uh, some sort of term, which is usually um, something like of the form of square root of C over N. There are different forms as well, 
when C is some notion of complexity of that function class H. And in some cases, this H can be data dependent. Now, um, it's kind of nice to call them busy week. What you see is what you get, because you see what's on the left is what you get, right? That's the future. What you have on the right, the empirical risk, is what you see on your training set. So essentially, they said that what you see <clears throat> on the training set is what you will get in the future. And um, the sort of upshot of this is this nice um, figure from uh, Vaptic's book, which said that uh, it's similar to the one I showed before, but it's a little bit more precise. It shows that on the x-axis, you have the size of your class H. On the y-axis, you have the error and the risk. And uh, you have empirical risk, which is the first part of this. So the, the, this is empirical risk, right? Uh, this is going down as H increases because with more functions, you can fit better, but the model complexity is going up, right? So the, what he calls confidence interval, which is this model complexity term, this is going up and empirical risk is going down. And because the bound is composed of the sum, it has this U-shaped curve. And this is the optimum. So now um, I've spent some time on this, but uh, To, to set it up because um, somehow to make it clear what's, what's going wrong with uh, empirical observations, we have to sort of uh, fix the idea of what is to be expected. And uh, now he, here are some really interesting observations. And um, I, I think in this paper by Jean et al, uh, from a, this, uh, which is called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization. Um, the case, the, they make the case that you can train the neural network to have 100% accuracy. So it's perfect. It fits the data perfectly. And yet the test accuracy is still quite good. So if there is overfitting, it's not large, right? They get almost 90% test accuracy, which is pretty remarkable. And uh, they use some sort of neural network architecture. So this actually suggests that uh, interpolation that is fitting the dead trading data exactly doesn't overfit or at least doesn't overfit much. This actually, I should point out, is not a new observation. Um, and in fact, uh, in 98, there was um, a well-known paper boosting the margin by Shapir, Freud, Bartlett, and Lee. And uh, they analyzed boosting and uh, sort of the whole analysis based on the observation that the test error of generated hypothesis, I'm quoting from this, usually does not increase as its size becomes very large and often is observed to decrease even after the training error reaches zero. So it's a uh, exactly this phenomenon. So even after the training error, well, classification error reaches zero, you still get better performance. So um, this is probably, you know, was observed in early 90s, this kind of phenomenon or mid 90s. Uh, for the, well, I don't know, for the first time or not. Uh, okay. Now, uh, let me point out that this is suggestive, but doesn't directly validate VisiWeek bounds because, uh, well, we don't know what the true accuracy should be. And maybe the true accuracy is 100%. And then, uh, you know, maybe data totally separable. And then, of course, this is not, uh, you know, inconsistent with this bounds that we have. Uh, so how do we test model complexity? And let, let me sort of uh, give you an experimental setup. So I, it's, uh, 
kind of a physics-like experiment. <laughs> uh, and th there is actually a simple uh, sort of test model when we can test model complexity. And um, the idea is to add label loss. So let, let me just um, tell you how it works. So imagine I have two data, uh, uh, data set with two classes. And suppose my classes are actually linearly separable, like here, right? So there is a line, uh, and you know, this line separates them perfectly. So the test error should be zero for the optimal predictor. Now, uh, what if I do the following? So inter notice that interpolating here is okay, right? Because the slide interpolates, right? On everything to the left, I'll call red, and everything to the right, I'll call blue, right? That's uh, my uh, interpolation. Now, uh, what do I do? Well, I can add label noise. And what do I mean by label loss? Um, the easiest way probably to do it is just to flip some of the labels. So I take say 10% of the labels and I flip them. So at random. So you can see I flip this two and this one, okay? Uh, now you can see that uh, if I am to separate the red from blue, it's going to be a very complicated boundary. I need to have uh, something like this. Oops, I don't know. Okay, I'm not doing a great job, but you can see that the model complexity required to interpolate this data now is dramatically higher than it was for the line. Right? So somehow by adding label noise, I'm forcing the label complex of the, the model complexity of an interpolating model to increase dramatically. And presumably uh, that, you know, would require uh, the model to overfit. But notice, however, that the optimal model does not change. The optimal is still here. And, um, you know, if you should think how the, the, the flip works, you see that the optimal doesn't change because this is still the best. It's just that some labels get flipped as long as the flip is less than 50%. So, uh, so this is interesting because you can see that there is kind of adding label noise create this, um, this um, somehow it causes the, optimal model and the interpolating model to diverge, right? Uh, one is very simple, the other is rather complex. Uh, okay, so, and the sort of theoretically, what we expect is that overfitting will become bad as the model complexity grows. But let's see what actually happens in practice. And this is uh, an experiment uh, which we did with um, my students, see you on my and Sumit Mandel. Uh, here is the uh, experiment. So we took, um, this was on, uh, I think on the MNIST, which is a 10 class handwritten digit classifier. So it's 10 class. So on the X axis, I have now label noise. So we're adding more and more label noise. On the y-axis, I have a classification error. So notice that zero classification error um, is great, right? It's the best. And 90% classification error is random since it's a 10 class problem. Now the green line here is the sort of the theoretical optimal, right? Because when there is no label noise, you kind of do better than 0%. And you can see that when adding noise, it's actually just a line connecting at 100% label noise, right? It's a completely random prediction. So it's a line connecting zero and um, sort of the, the left corner of this and the right corner of this. Um, now, uh, what am I showing here? I'm showing several methods. But in particular, you can look at the Laplace curl because it's kind of the nicest uh, curve here. And the, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with kernel machines, it 
doesn't really matter what it is exactly. The important part of it is that it's a method which fits my training data exactly, okay? And by exactly, I literally mean exactly with zero training square loss. Well, it's not technically zero, but it's uh, like machine zero, 10 to the minus 25, something like that. Very, very small at precision level, essentially. You can do something similar with neural network, but with neural network, uh, so with a kernel machine, you have an analytical solution by matrix inversion. With a neural network, you have to train it, so it's not possible to get quite such a low error, but you get still something quite small in square loss and you get zero in classification loss. Uh, okay, so that's basically what I have. And now we observe a pretty remarkable thing here is that even when the label noise is quite high, right? Like at 70%, the classification, the, um, the classification error of my um, Laplace kernel machine is maybe only five to 8% worse than the best optimal. And that's pretty remarkable because think about what it's doing. It's fitting 70%. So 70% of my points are junk, right? There is no, I'm fitting tremendous amount of noise, but yet I'm paying for it very little. So the, um, there is very, very little overfitting. So that seems somehow um, difficult to reconcile with the bounds that we have seen before. And let me sort of be a little bit more analytic why, about why this is difficult to reconcile. Uh, so what was the bound that we had before? Uh, we had this type of busy weak bound. And the question is, can uniform bounds like this account for generalization of the interpolation? And the question is, uh, well, on the left, you have test loss. Right, and in the presence of noise in my data, the test loss is actually not equal to zero. The training loss, however, is equal to zero. So this part disappears. And now the test loss needs to be exactly bounded by some sort of model complexity. Um, and uh, this is quite difficult. And why this is difficult is, well, let's think about what this means. So if you look at a high noise level, like 80%, then you see that the test loss, like to explain what we see, right? The test loss would have to be bounded by 0.7 on the left and 0.9 on the right. Like why? Because you see on the right, if it's bigger than 0.9, right, it's useless. Since it's, you know, not telling me anything better than random. If it's smaller than 0.7 on the left, that's uh, better than the best possible. So that's impossible, that's wrong. So that's basically what it is. So you have to have it in this very narrow band between 0.7 and 0.9 to be both correct and useful. And the problem is, is that this is very difficult to have a bound like that for any sort of realistic scenario. Why? Because, well, there are like constants here in O star. First, there are constants, right? And even the constant, uh, you know, factor of two will already break this um, bound. And there are log factors, and there are all sorts of um, other things. So there are really no bounds like that. Oh, okay, I, I should moderate this slightly. Um, so in some very special cases, actually, there could be bounds which are almost exact, like for linear regression with Gaussian terms. And uh, actually, recently, there was a nice work by uh, from the uh, um, Rebrus group, and they, they analyzed, they showed that uh, um, uh, one specific example where this is possible. But uh, certainly you wouldn't expect such a bound to exist in general. 
And um, it was worse kind of conceptually, how would the quantity C of N, how would model complexity know about the base risk? Because somehow it has to know about this left part. And that seems difficult. So there was actually some recent work, um, in particular in the garage and in Colt and uh, Bartlett and Long, who showed that in some, for some uh, kind of general cases, such bounds do not exist. Uh, so that's basically maybe a summary of the crisis that we have for generalization is that the observed phenomena of deep learning seem to contradict to, uh, you know, what we would expect in theory. So theory and experiments do not fit. And uh, Now you could say, well, is this really the sort of, maybe this is some sort of marginal thing, but really um, in some sense, you can say that interpolation is best practice for deep learning. And um, I, I really like this quote from um, Ruslan's tutorial. Uh, he said that the best way to solve the problem from practical standpoint, you build a big system and basically you want to make sure you hit zero trading. So you really want the system which interpolates. And now, uh, well, if you want to get state of the art results, this is not the end, like you, you do other things to the system. But if you already at this point, when you get zero trading error, it already works okay. So you already have some generalization. And really the practice of machine learning has been building bigger and bigger systems. and. Um, the, this is a summary from uh, 2017 of the systems, um, different uh, architectures. So each circle here corresponds to an architecture. The small ones are about um, 5 million parameters. The big ones is about 150 million parameters. So the one I showed you on the first slide is actually a small one. It only has about <coughs> 6 million parameters. Now, um, that was 2017. Um, in 2020, we have GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters. This is to scale. So the area of a circle corresponds to the number of parameters. Uh, and well, uh, in 2021, there is something called switch transformer, which has trillions of parameters. And uh, but by the way, the, you, you can see this other architecture, they're all here. Uh, so they have been this kind of relentless growth of the number of parameters, this uh, extremely, extremely large system. Although arguably you should say that they also trade on very large data sets. So there have been uh, sort of historical recognition of this. And uh, well, Jan, uh, of course, on many occasions says that something like deep learning breaks some basic rules of statistics. Uh, remarkably, uh, in 95, Leo Breiman, um, a statistician uh, from Berkeley, uh, he, he, he wrote this uh, very interesting uh, note called Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPS. And he asked several questions. And the first one was, why don't heavily parameterized neural networks overfeed the data? And uh, was really kind of, uh, was clear to him, even in 95, that there was some sort of issue. So that's maybe the summary of empirical findings. So that's, um, a nice uh, sort of, uh, so that's kind of a way to, you know, summarize this. Uh, the goal of optimization, which is simply interpolating or minimizing empirical loss, aligns with the goal of machine learning, which is minimizing the expected loss. And I, I say this is truly, I think, unexpected from a classical statistics point of view, because, um, Traditionally, we use some sort of capacity control or similar ideas based on regularization and so on. So that's basically, uh, that's maybe the summary of 
the sort of uh, the meat of this crisis of generalization. And uh, yeah, are, are there any uh, it, it sort of to summarize as a theory that if, if we want a new theory of induction, which we do definitely want, it cannot be based on this kind of classical uniform lots of large numbers with capacity control. And the question is sort of what's next. Any any questions? I'm more than happy to sort of maybe this is a nice point to sort of take a short break and see if there is any question. Yeah, uh, I see Br Bryn has a question. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned this paper earlier, the Bartlett paper on boosting the margin, um, uh -huh. and, and that some of these um, sort of interpolation, yeah, not overfitting things are seen in that uh, mm -hmm. as well. I'm wondering if there's a lot of been much work in studying boosting um, as an analogy for deep learning. At the moment, because it seems like most of it after the whole NTK thing is is concentrated around random features and kernels. I'm wondering if you think there's like stuff to be understood mm. about deep learning from looking at boosting. I haven't seen that's a really that's an interesting question. So I, I think it, there was a lot of study of boosting early on in like late 90s and early 2000s, and I think there was recently much less. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. Uh, yeah, so my impression is that there is there haven't been as much study. I, I mean, the thing with NTK is that this gives a very direct connection to uh, between kernels and neural networks, uh, which I guess is not the case with boosting. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I should point out that boosting is still used very widely, like. Um, what is it called? XGBoost, right? That's a, some form of boosting. That's like one of the most popular methods. Uh, like if you use, if you look at Kaggle, it's like uh, very, very popular. Uh, but probably not used as much to analyze uh, deep learning. Yeah, uh, another question. Uh, are it's, I, I have a question, it's more of a historical question about the Zhang et al. paper. Mm -hmm. so we know that neural networks are highly expressive, right? There's lots mm -hmm. of proof. So it's not at all surprising that, you know, if you make a big neural network, you should be able to get zero training error. We also know empirically that they generalize well, doing that longer mm -hmm. than Zhang et al. paper. So I was, I, I know this paper, the one question maybe for you to comment on is why has this, why was it this particular paper that so much caught everyone's imagination. I mean, the way I read the paper is more something like this, which is to say, um, what it really shows is that SGD is a very good optimizer because they're able to get find the zero training errors on randomly labeled data. But I was not surprised at all that they could find those solutions because they're highly expressive. That's right. So, so in some sense, it is perhaps not surprising, right? Because okay, yeah, yeah, there are like tons and tons of parameters. Why shouldn't you be able to fit the data? Um, but I think the fact well, well, there, that there are proofs, such, there are proofs, right? There's expressivity proofs. Um, uh, the express sure there are expressivity proofs, but I think the, I, I think what what you say is correct. What is what is not obvious is that this kind of gradient-based method can do something because, yeah, yeah, the proofs are kind of very generic, right? They're just saying that some class of functions is big. But why would SGD find something like that? You know, the analysis are convex in classically, and this yeah. clearly is very, very non-convex. So I think that was maybe the kind of, the surprising thing is that non-convexity doesn't matter. Yeah. And they really systematically showed it very nicely with this, like editing noise and writing this one. So that somehow caught the imagination, I think. Uh, I think that was a kind of historically a very significant work. Uh, okay, so let me maybe continue if there are no further questions. Uh, Yeah, so, so what if new theory of induction can be based on this? Well, we're next. And I, I think actually it's kind of uh, pretty remarkable that um, 
<laughs> in retrospect, at least, is that what there is stable classifier, right? What there is stable is uh, probably the most classical predictor, certainly one of them is linear regression. And uh, it has a, first it's a interpolating classifier, right? Because one there is stable, one there is stable interpolates. Second, it has a non trivial and sharp performance guarantee that it's twice the base risk due to covering heart in 67. They actually, they prove more than that, but the, this is one of the things. Uh, when I say twice, it's actually there is a more precise thing, but it's bounded by twice. And it's not explained, and as far as I know, never was explained by empirical risk minimization. So, so sort of in retrospect, it's kind of interesting because we sort of thought, okay, Wapnik's um, theory, Wapnik's claim that this is the theory of um, learning is reasonable, but yet it doesn't explain this very simple um, algorithm, right? One nearest neighbor. But can be simpler. So there, there was some sort of disconnect uh, between this, which sort of went unnoticed. And uh, actually, uh, you could, you could, so twice the matrix, maybe it's still kind of far from optimal, but you could push this. And there is um, a very actually interesting, this kind of uh, singular kernel interpolation scheme which I, I originally was known as Shepard's, well, well, still known as Shepard's interpolation. And uh, there was a remarkable result by Devroy, Georgi, and uh, Kruzak, I probably uh, not saying the name correctly, in 98, when they showed that for a certain kernel, this scheme produces, uh, um, it's consistent for regression. Um, and the scheme is this kind of classical kernel smoothing the Darai Watson scheme. Uh, I'm so, so just give it by this equation, but using a singular kernel. So the kernel has a singularity, it has a pole. Uh, so it has this something like this. Uh, in any case, um, you could actually push this more, and um, we showed so with um, Daniel Su and Partly Train that there was a follow up with Sasha Rockley and Sasha Tsibakov. That, in fact, there is kind of if you're allowing this nearest neighbor type of scheme with this weight, you can actually have a class of the singular kernels, and in fact, you even can get optimal rates and so on. So you can essentially get statistically optimal predictors for this, which is pretty strange because they look crazy. And that's what they look like. So, so I, I think this picture on the right uh, is, um, so you have data, which is just in uh, one dimensional, and the true thing is y equals x. So it's y equals x plus noise. And what you have, you have this, uh, this data, and the, so the blue line is optimal prediction. The red curve is what you get from one of these uh, schemes. And you can see that at every data point, this red curve is not close to the line. So if a priori the blue line is impossible to beat, it's the best. At every point, this red curve is not close to the line, but yet, when you get enough data, somehow on average, it will converge to the blue line and it will become optimal. So it's a very weird, it's a very weird sort of non-intuitive kind of predictor. And it, what it seems, and in, in some sense you can quantify that in high dimension, that becomes even easier for it to be optimal. There is some sort of blessing of dimensionality here. But even in one dimension, it's optimal in this mini box set. So, you know, that's what you get. Uh, now, uh, yeah, so, so as you can see, this is kind of a very counterintuitive from a traditional point of view because, you know, it just looks strange. And uh, maybe I'll skip this adversarial examples. So, so, so here, here is uh, what we have so far is that interpolation empirically aligns with generalization, that's um, empirical observation. Second, theory of interpolation should not be based on uniform bounds. 
And there is at least some methods like this nearest neighbor interpolating methods, which have statistical validity. Now, uh, there is a mismatch, obviously, between A and C, because uh, this nearest neighbor type of methods, like one nearest neighbor, they have no capac uh, capacity control or complexity control, and they have no optimization. Yet, Practical methods always use optimization and they, in some sense, use the largest sort of feasible models, right? In some sense, you have some, you build a model which is based on how many GPUs you have, right? Google have like, you know, 10,000 GPUs and they build a model with trillion parameters, something like that. Um, so the key question is dependence on generalization of model complexity, and in particular the number of parameters, because that's, it's, I mean, you could argue whether the number of parameters is the right measure of model complexity, perhaps it's not, but it is the thing that we observe, right? When you choose a model, that's what you have. You have the number of parameters. You don't have spectral norms. You don't have this more complicated things. And, uh, this is uh, the sort of where uh, the double descent curve comes in. And uh, if you sort of see um, the standard curve, which is on the left, you have underfitting and overfitting, right? And as you increase in complexity, you go through the few curve. And then the question is, what happens if you increase your complexity even further path the point of interpolation. So at this point, the model is complex enough to fit the data exactly. And the performance actually is not good. But as you increase the model complexity, it turns out that all of these models to the right are interpolating, but the larger model actually generalized better. And that, that, that's what we call the double descent because there are somehow these two. Oh, and this was joint work with Daniel Su. See you by to make my doll. And uh, yeah, so there is the kind of the classical descent, and then there is this modern descent. And the interesting thing is that the modern descent often goes, often but not always, goes to infinity. So the more parameters you have, the better your performance becomes. So of course, it doesn't go to zero, right? The risk never goes to zero, but it monotonically decreases in many cases. And often the bottom of the few is actually higher than the point of the right. So very complex model can outperform classical models. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, what we observe, which is, you know, and that's what people in uh, you know, deep learning have been observing. And that was kind of the impetus for building such large models. And yeah, so there have been a number of different observations of this type of things. Maybe let me skip this. But let, let me maybe, um, I don't have a lot of time left, but let me maybe uh, uh, say a few words about uh, what is the mechanism for that. And let, let me just take a very simple model, which is this um, random ReLU network. So you have two, layers and you first the first layer is fixed it's just random so you can say it's a random ready feature model and this is what it works what it looks like so i'm just doing it in one dimension so if you have three neurons you have this kind of nice parametric fit you just have this uh, nice curve so the, the, i have i think 11 data points in one dimension uh, and if I increase the number of neurons and I have 30 neurons, I get some sort of classical overfitting, right? I, I fit the data, but it looks awful and it probably has no uh, generalization power. It kind of oscillates all over the place. And if I increase the number of neurons to 3000, this actually becomes a nice non-parametric model. Now, the model is non-parametric. Of course, the model is technically parametric. It has whatever, 3,000 parameters, um, but it's not parametric in the sense that it's close to the limit. Like if I take 3 million, it would essentially look the same. So 
it's pretty nice because what you can see is that as you increase the number of parameters, you go from parametric models to some sort of bad overfitting to non-parametric models. So you, you can combine both in the same on the same kind of axis, which is, um, you, you know, I think that kind of bodes well for having some sort of theory potentially, although we, we don't have that yet, but uh, no, no, not complete. Um, okay, maybe I'll keep this. You can um, you can do this. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, one point I would like to uh, sort of uh, say is that as you increase the number of features, it's a similar model, but I don't want to discuss what it is. Um, what you can show is that the norm of the predictor it kind of increases with the number of features initially, and then it decreases again. And that's because, you see, when the number of features is actually equal to the number of data points, you have a unique solution, and the solution is usually awful because you have to fit noise. But when the number of features much larger than the number of data points, you have many solutions which fit the data. And if you choose the minimum norm solution, it has some sort of desirable properties. So more features or more of a parameterization allows you a bigger space to choose your interpolating solution from. And among those solutions, there are some which are good. And uh, it happens that the minimum norm solution is, all, is not always, is frequently good. That's basically so. More features somehow allows you to give you a better approximation to the true minimum norm solutions. So very briefly, that's what it is. And uh, let me just fix this. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of work on trying to understand this, in particular for interpolating linear models and for a random features model. Uh, there is actually recently a very nice uh, work by uh, Holzmuller. Uh, who showed that uh, there is a lower bound on the number of features. So P, so if you look at the bottom, okay, it's, ah, what's going on? Why is my, I cannot, for some reason I cannot draw. Uh, in any case, look at the absolute noise. That's a lower bound on the loss. And P is the number of features and N is the number of data points. And it basically says that when P is close to M, right, this is quite large. So you have this peak, but when P is much larger than N, this goes to zero and the lower bound, well, it doesn't tell you about the upper bound, but you can have very good predictors. And um, the, the nice thing about his result is that it's quite general. It's essentially worked for any model. Uh, okay, so, let me, I am uh, almost out of time. So let me actually just do a summary. Uh, and then I want to say like one word about optimization. So to summarize, you can kind of think maybe as a framework for model machine learning is some sort of Occam's razor. And uh, what you would like to say, you would like to maximize smoothness subject to interpolating the data. And what do I mean by smoothness? Uh, that could be some sort of averaging process, or this could be, and I didn't really discuss averaging very much, or it could be uh, some sort of minimum norm solution. So, you know, like when you have like a lot of random features, this is some sort of self-smoothing uh, process. And there are really three ways to increase smoothness. You could look at this functional norm solutions like exact kernel machine, so maybe approximate with random features. You could do it through optimization implicitly. Um, and we understand this for, again, for this type of linear models and parameters or random feature type of models, not so much for neural networks in general. Or you could do averaging like begging and boosting type of processes. Well, bo boosting is somehow a bit bit. And interestingly, all of this processes, all, all of this ways coincides for kernel machines. So there is something quite nice about kernel. Uh, okay, so that's um, that's um, 
all about generalization. Uh, now, uh, maybe just one point here is that I, I think the nice thing about it that overfitting kind of shows in a different light on this curve is that overfitting really is a band of parameters around interpolation threshold. And you can combat overfitting by decreasing the number of parameters for regularization or by increasing the number of parameters and essentially building bigger systems. Uh, now, uh, let me, uh, given that I don't have time, let me just point out something quite interesting about landscapes of whole parameterized model, models and why neural networks uh, seem to be not too difficult to um, optimize. And well, the, the landscapes, of course, are not convex. And, uh, you know, like in classically, we think of non convex as something like this, which is terrible, right? We can find anything by gradient descent, or rather, we can find some local minimum, which is probably no good. Uh, but this is actually a rather misleading way to think about overparameterized system. And really, you need to think of overparameterized system as something like that. So the landscapes are, uh, have this manifolds of minima, and every minimum is a global minimum. So, and you can see that on the left, gradient descent will not work, right? If you roll a ball downhill, it will just get stuck in the closest local minimum. But on the right, a ball, if you roll it downhill, it will actually go to a global minimum. So these are kind of benign landscapes, even though they're non-convex. And they're actually non-convex in a very strong sense that they're locally non-convex at every point. Um, as long as this manifold of minima has curvature, basically they're always non-convex. So um, this can be analyzed and we argue that uh, there is this kind of classical idea of Poliak and Lajasevich, this condition, which we argue that the overparameterized system satisfies. that. But let me uh, stop here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so this is maybe the kind of summary. So you have this classical models and you need careful parameter selection here. And there are many non-global minima, and you have issues with optimization. And there are these modern models, and essentially with modern models, you could just take models to be quite large. And uh, uh, you don't need a lot of uh, regularization, and you know your gradient descent method converts somehow more or less for free which is pretty remarkable, uh, probably what makes deep learning possible to a large degree. So I'll stop here and I'm uh, very happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, any question from our audience? 